Do you ever feel like maybe your job, society, your family, your world, your everything doesn't function as it really should? And maybe that it's not just an accident, but maybe a deliberate ploy? Well, today Rod tells us the story of someone who came up with a bunch of genius ideas to gum up the works. Have a listen and tell us how many of those are happening in your world today. Enjoy. Central Greece. Yes. 1942. Ooh. Operation Harling. Harling? Yeah, a.k.a. the Battle of Gorgopotamus. <laughs> Flawless Greek accent. Gorgopotamus. You'll be amazed here. It was a joint operation between POMs and Greek resistance. Cool. Hence the two very different names. Cool. This is a, this is a movie scenario that we're talking about. Oh, it really is. It really is. And so th their mission was to, they have to destroy. No, they have to get to the Oracle of Delphi yep, yep. and find an ancient Greek room that will uh, defeat the Nazis somehow. Cure the war. Yeah, cool. So their mission was actually to destroy a very heavily guarded Gorgopotamus viaduct. 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 And it was one of the first major sabotage acts. Hang on, this is a... Viaducts, to my mind, yeah. were made 2,000 years ago. Yeah, not this. And so destroying a viaduct now- You just wait. Seems to, <laughs> you just wait. But I can't quite imagine that the Nazi war machine was using viaducts all the time. It was deemed significant enough that it needed to be destructifying. Okay. So it was one of the first major sabotage acts in the Axis-occupied Europe. Oh. 150 men. Yep. 12 pommies. Who were the demolition party? They were are the they, skilled chaps. Are they part of the men, or are they in addition to the? They, they are men. also men. Okay, yes. oh, they, just, they, they're all the men. It, it, it felt a little bit sledging of of the English folk. Yeah, I'm, I'm, 150 I'm, men plus 12 English. Plus 12 men. English, but yeah. we're allowed. That's punching up, right? Uh, it's punching something. <laughs> it's not that kind of podcast. <laughs> so 12 bombs and a whole bunch. So basically, another 130 odd Greek resistance chappies from a couple of organisations whose names I won't even bother pronouncing. And they had a plan. They're like sororities or fraternities. Yes, they they're, were, they're all yeah. Alpha Kappa the Pi. Kappa Mu and, uh, Omega. Epsilon, plan. Epsilon, Mepsilon. Mm -hmm. Can you see through this? <laughs> Two teams of eight guerrillas were to cut the railway and telephone lines in both directions uh -huh. and then also cover the approaches to the bridge, aka aqueduct, so viaduct. So I assume it was a bridge like yep. trains. Main force of 100 guerrillas would neutralize the garrison, um, who were mostly Italian troops. It's a bit, a bit rough. Well, they're baddies in this point. They're on the wrong side. Yeah. Demolition party would divide into three teams, wait upriver until the garrison had been subdued, then lay the charges. Okay. Um, it worked. Cool. No boom, more boom, viaduct. Boom, boom, boom. That was a very elaborate and grand scale operation. That's, bye bye, Gorgopotamus. Yes. There was a lot of planning, a lot of coordination, a lot of training. There were a couple of glitches and, you know, improvisations, but it yeah, worked. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Gorgopotamus went boom, boom. Canada, 1982. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Rocketing forward 40 years, the Littleton Industries bombing. Three members of an anarchist group known as Direct Action. They were urban guerrillas. Mm -hmm. um, they really wanted to end the arms race. Okay. By bombing something? It's ironic, isn't it? I don't think anyone has ended an arms race by bombing something. No, 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 no. It's like an oil well. If there's too much fire, you need big boom, boom to make fire. But okay, fire. but they're, they're concerned about like nukes and stuff like yeah. that. So, Very. you know, they're anarchists and they don't want any more nukes. Mm. So... Mm. Back to small bombs. We'll show you what small bombs can do too. Yeah, small bomb. 550 kilos <laughs> of dynamite. Jesus. So they stole the pickup truck, packed it with this 550 kilos. They parked the truck outside Littleton Industries in, I think it was Toronto. What, what is Littleton Industries? Uh, they made American cruise missile components, okay. among other things. I, I thought Little in, Littleton Industries was benign. Like it was like- They make tea. No, it was model railway stuff. Like yeah. they make little tons. And gloves like, for yeah. children. <laughs> Maybe they did. Maybe they're like General Electric. We'll make a microwave. We'll make some and cars bombs. and landmines. So the van apparently had a fluorescent warning box duct taped to the hood. And it said, oh, on, on connected to this box was a, a message, a digital clock counting down and a single stick of dynamite. Okay. Just to kind of go big, big boom, yeah, boom. Yeah, take here. this seriously. Big boom, boom. And there was a, a quite detailed message. Inside the van are 550 pounds of commercial dynamite. This will explode any time within 15 to 25 minutes after the van was parked here. The dynamite will be set off by two completely separate detonating systems. Do not enter or move the van. It will explode. Just a, just a tiny aside. Yeah. But the terrorists of the 70s and 80s, 
were in general a lot more polite about their bombs. <laughs> freedom fighters. Uh, well, yeah, terrorists. One man's freedom of fighter is another man's mm. terrorist. But no, they were like the IRA were quite big on phoning in that there's a bomb yeah. and getting everyone to evacuate first. Yeah. Uh, things changed later, but yeah. it was very genteel. Well, these, these folks were trying to do the same thing. So, like, they didn't want people in ho- nearby hotels and factories to get hurt, so they would said, warn them all, mm-hmm. get them out. One of the bombers also called the security desk and said, look, there's a dynamite bomb. It's in the van outside. It'll go off in 15 to 20 minutes. Evacuate the plant, blah, 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 blah. Went off a bit early. Ah, oh. No one died. Okay. Injured That's three good. police, uh, three passing motorists and five employees. Took out a 15-metre section of wall, damaged two adjacent buildings, and they reckon his estimated damages were anywhere from about four to fifty million dollars. Four million to fifty million. Canadian dollars, though. So. Yes, yeah, so like eight bucks. I have no idea. No, eight, it could eight bucks more. Australian. Could have been more. So um little in industry said, slowed us down for a week, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The anarchists, however, called it a massive success. But they were caught really easily because basically there was shitloads of evidence and they're like, Yeah, we, yeah, we did it. Wow. Okay. You, you got us. It's it's us. And the sentences range from six years to up to life. Life. Well, there was also a lot of uh, – there were sort of related crimes, you know, stealing the truck, getting the explosives, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Having so, dynamite without a li- license. Yeah, you didn't have your boom, boom license. But, again, this was a huge coordinated effort. It took lots of planning and it had a big result. Okay. So these are two examples of really spectacular acts of sabotage, you know, like you'd have to be highly motivated, well-resourced, properly pretty well-trained, you know, prepared to die or at least spend a lot of time in prison, it's, it's a big deal. But you don't always have to do it that way because in the spirit of democracy and with a little hat tip to citizen science, okay, sabotage is a game anyone can play. <laughs> okay. And so it can be perpetrated in very mundane environments by just about anyway. So welcome to the world of citizen saboteurs. Welcome to The Wholesome Show. podcast that lurks suspiciously around the whole of science. I'm Will Grant. I'm Roderick G. Lamberts. Sabotage, eh? Yeah. So if we want to set the scene for citizen sabotage. Citizen sabotage. I know. We go back to January 1883, as as you would have guessed. This is when William Joseph Wild Bill Donovan was born. Was he born Wild Bill Donovan? He was born wild. He came out screaming with a knife between his teeth. He was was a wild kid. He was a wild boy. So he ended up at Columbia Uni, and apparently he, this is a quote, used his physical magnetism and innate charm to better himself. Well, he had the Kavorka. He did have the Kavorka. So he joined a big-time fraternity, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Moomoo fraternity. So, yeah, he rode on the varsity crew, so he rode. He won oratory prizes, a campus football hero, classmate of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, Also, he was voted the uh, two things. The most modest and one of the handsomest members Stop of it. the graduating wait, class. Wait, wait, wait. How do you how do you vote on the most modest? You like, vote, vote for yourself, obviously. You self nominate. Why, why? Why is that an award? Why not? After school, <laughs> he became a lawyer because you do. And he married. Great quote here: a blonde horsewoman. <laughs> you could have said that slowly, and I. I you... <laughs> Her name was Ruth Rumsey. She was the daughter of the richest man in Buffalo. Buffalo, New York. And he somehow, this is probably part of his physical magnetism, etc. he became the first Roman Catholic to be offered membership in the elite uh, Saturn Club. Hey. I know, right? What happens in the Saturn Club? I, I don't know. I'm not allowed to know. Uh, I'm not a member. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. He also studied military strategy, combat tactics, stuff like this. And so a few years in, he joins with some society chaps and he forms a cavalry troop mm. known as the Silk, Silk Stocking Boys. <laughs> Sounds so rugged, doesn't it? It, it, does, it like come with me, fellas. <laughs> why aren't why aren't bikey gangs named things like that these days? We're the fucking silk stocking gang, you fucks. I feel yeah. like I feel like they Buy could lean heroin. into it. It was like I can handle whatever name. I agree. Like the wussier your name, the tougher you got to be uh, to absolutely. back it up. Absolutely. So cavalry trip. Um, they ended up chasing the Mexican bandit Pancho Villa along the Rio Grande. So they <laughs> no, they were they involved. Did. Pancho Villa. It sounds to me a little bit like if you were some sort of American adventurer in charge of the Silk Stocking Boys mm. and you went away for a weekend of drinking mm. and you had to tell your your, your significant horsewoman yes. where you had been, that you'd been chasing the Mexican bandit Pancho oh, oh, Villa yeah. down the road. What Ruby. was his name? Pancho? <laughs> uh-huh. What else? Rodriguez? I don't believe uh, you. Villa. 
And then he moves on. He joins the 1st Cavalry Regiment, brackets, New York National Guard, and was stationed in Texas. So hang on, just go back a second. Mm. So he formed a Cavalry reg- Regiment. Was this just he and a bunch of the guys got together? Seems like or it. Or did they, did they write to the army and say, we want to join as a group? Dear army. Or did, did the army say, hey, we need a group of horsey people? And we need a good name. <laughs> like it doesn't sound it's, really sanctioned. It doesn't ambiguous. sound official. Like general such and yeah. such said, I need a silk stocking boy. Yes. No, it's ambiguous. I, I couldn't tell. Militaries um, are weird back then. So 1917, the US said, World War I looks cool. Yeah, it's been going for a while and terrible. So well, ma- now is the time. We're going to hero on in. So he became a major with the Fighting 69th, which was- fighting est. Fighting, no, just fighting. What I find amusing is weren't the others fighting too? No, they weren't. Just them. They're the only ones doing it. That's true. And they were poor, tough Irish dudes who called themselves Mix, which is probably where it came from. But Donovan weeded out the troublemakers. Oh, of course. And he apparently picked 2,000 smart, athletic, and agile men. And he was infamous for demanding wild and crazy levels of physical training for recruits, but he also took part. Yeah, of course. All in silk stockings? God, I hope so. But this wasn't cavalry anymore, so maybe oh, yeah. not. It would just look weird. Yeah. They were sent to France. So one battle, 1918, middle of 1918. So Donovan leads his men across the Urk River in northern France. Urk. Your French pronunciation has uh, gotten better over the summer. Uh, O-U-R-C-Q in northern France. So they were hemmed in by machine guns on three sides. The fighting 69th, though, they took no prisoners. No, well, if you're going to die, yeah. you're not taking prisoners. I don't think. I don't think that's on the option here. No, it's not a big. No, so sixty percent of them died. Six hundred of a thousand men, including three quarters of the officers and both Donovan's aides de camp. But they they got through, and Donovan got a distinguished services cross for his um, distinguished service, mm-hmm. second highest for honor. Getting uh, getting out two, alive. Two thirds of your men and three quarters of your officers to die. Indebted. Yeah, great. And they, then there was another battle. So later in the same year, they're near Londres et Saint Georges, you know the place. So he's going into battle. Donovan ignored the standard customs of officers, which was to take off all your your medals, your rank, etc., so you don't get sniped. Oh, of course, because they yeah. aim for the officers. I, I get your rank, but were they wearing medals? At the, the I think some got a bit fancy, and he said, "Fuck this," and he wore everything, full medals and everything, <laughs> <laughs> just no. in, no. <laughs> in and at the front. Yeah, okay. Wild Bill. Yeah, all right. It's not the most wild thing to wear all of your in, in, insignia. insignia. Yeah. They're going to battle, not smart. Um, and he apparently screamed out, they can't hit me and they won't hit you. That's what he said to his men. Anyway, he got shot in the knee by a bullet. <laughs> they can hit him. Turns out, just his knee though. And he, um, he refused to be evacuated and continued to lead his men until even American tanks were turning back. But he's like, no, chaps, on and on we go. He also was apparently nearly blinded by gas. So oh, he's doing wow. well. So he got more medals. And he, so he's had ends up having two distinguished service cross medal things and a bunch of others. So he's mm. highly decorated dude. Comes out of World War One, highly decorated. So he goes home, starts being a lawyer in Buffalo. Rich bored the shit out of him. Uh, I get it. I'm amazed, right? Having, having done all that. War, yeah, war is terrible, but uh, I get that it's exciting. Mm. Of all the things. And if you tend to survive and look cool and people go, you're tops, yeah. that's quite heady. And you've got a whole carton of silk, silk stockings. Yes, you do. Leftovers. Then what are you going to do? You can't <laughs> lawyer in silk stockings. They're just for warring. Well, you can, but they mock you. So he got bored with that and he became um, a US attorney, which is apparently less boring. And he was a really, what is it, an extremely vigorous crime fighter. And he was particularly famous for wildly and strongly enforcing prohibition laws. Ah. He even raided the Satin Club. <laughs> What? Which was his, he was a member of the Satin Club. His like, No, you have broken the, the drinking laws and you're in trubs, so we're going to get you. So there are a bunch of threats to assassinate him and blow up his house, but he didn't give a shit and none of them happened. Huh. Huh. So the obvious next step, politics. Sure. I, I mean, of course. But he shitted it. So didn't do that. But he didn't really care because he was starting to get really infatuated with Europe and the brewing war. World War II, we're leaning up World towards. World War, the W, yeah. the yeah. W's of the twos. He wants some more of that. Yeah, he's like, what's he going on? He loved the charging into machine gun emplacements. Yeah. Uh, but I think he was also kind of intellectually curious. So apparently in 39, he met Franco on the front lines of the Spanish Civil War and he looked at what Nazi Germany's weapons and planes were doing and he's like, okay. Mm-hmm. Then he visits Mussolini in Italy. How many, how many like, leaders did he meet? Like he went to school with a Roosevelt. Number. Yeah, yeah, a number. In the bath with Churchill at some point? 
Oh, we'll get to Churchill. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll get to Churchill. He and Churchill would have been hilarious to hang out with. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, visits Mussolini and he wanders around uh, a bunch of countries that are on the edge of Hitler's Germany, just sort of sniffing it out okay. and seeing what's going on. And he was. this is all under the guise of travelling for business and pleasure. But he was actually intelligence gathering. Okay. Formal, was he like, like he was vaguely employed by no. intelligence, doing it for himself? No, he was doing it for a secretive private organisation. Oh, my God. Known as The Room. The, the, the Room? <laughs> it's like a Mike Myers movie. <laughs> the Pantavidet. Yeah, okay. And this is a group of international businessmen and lawyers who traded tips on the increasingly ominous developments in Europe. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Other jobs? I know we have mentioned in the past mm. that sound awesome and cool, but mm. uh, uh, I got to say, mm. traveling and gathering interesting information for, for, the room. for a secretive organizer, so as long as they're not terrible people. Of course they fucking are. They must be. Like it's secret international <laughs> cabal of businessmen and lawyers. All we care about is children and renewable <laughs> energy. <laughs> We're in it for the good. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, all right. The, the, yeah. uh, I'm, look, to be fair, I'm just making assumptions. They might be delightful chaps. Yeah, yeah. And for shit sure, they're all chaps. So as Hitler starts coming into proper power, Donovan's getting really into intelligence gathering. But the US at the time had no formal spy agency. I know, right? So in 1939, we see that Britain's facing the storm that's coming in Europe and they're going, hmm, and they started thinking, we need help. How do we caress the Americans into mm-hmm, this? Mm-hmm. And they, some of them, the higher ups in MI six saw a while Bill and thought, <laughs> "Let's get this guy." Okay, he's n- he's not the decision maker though. No, not the decision maker. But they're like, we could use this guy. He seems right. excited. He might be a gateway drug for the for the English to get involved with us, cool. or the Americans to get involved with this. So he had heaps of interactions with MI six people and up across British elites. For example, Churchill. Okay. And apparently in 1940, he met with Winnie and they saw in each other kindred spirits. Now, apparently they were both, you know, ex-cavalry chaps. Well, one talks about horses. Oh, not only that, they would recite heroic poetry together. Oh, Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) What a bonding experience that would be. For example. Oh, God. And oh, the thundering press of nights, they declaimed together. When as their war cry swell, may toll from heaven an angel bright and rouse a fiend from hell. Um, so then this is in 1940, in, in early 1941, so around New Year's apparently he was on a flight over to Gibraltar and he's cruising over France and he sees a bunch of stuff of German fighters and things and what they're doing. So he's kind of intrigued. As he would be. He then tours the Mediterranean and the Balkans and he saw British commandos doing desperate secret war stuff. Uh, how is he seeing this? I don't like, know. Isn't the point that, that Special classes. you don't get seen if you're a commando? Yeah, they're not that good at it. All right, okay. Well, maybe they are, but well, he, he had inside information like, uh, look down there. Don't look at the diversion. Maybe it's like, the, I, I assume there is a system though where occasionally the commandos have to take the work experience kid with them. Yeah, like and, ne- Nev's got to come and, on And, and we've got to bring Nev on this journey. And you know, not he's really qualified. Nev's in year 10 and you've got you to carry him. What do you want to do? A, a, Sabotage, sir. <laughs> Any experience? None, really. I fucked with my sister's toys. <laughs> it's not the same, Neville. So he's, he's, he's thinking this is pretty good. So he came back to America going, look, we've really got to get into this war stuff and use cloak and dagger. So he gets into Roosevelt and goes, come on, dude. I don't yeah. know if it was like, mate, remember me from uni. I'm sorry I stole your lunch. I, don't, I have no background on that. But anyway, he talks to Roosevelt. Roosevelt signs an order calling him coordinator of information. He's the COI now. It's a cool role. Seems like it. So then Pearl Harbor happens. Donovan meets with Roosevelt who says, look, talking about this coordinated information thing, it's really good you pushed me into getting this going. I'm glad okay. we kicked this okay, off because of you. Yep. And apparently Hitler, when he declared war on the United States, mentions Donovan. Really? Who he calls utterly unworthy. <laughs> so which means But in particular, scary. I'm declaring yeah. war because of that Wild Bill Donovan guy. Yeah, and maybe some other buggers. But I, yeah. I, I do like the idea of being personally mentioned yeah. in Hitler's Name declaration of Hitler. war. Like, it, the, you know, you judge by the quality of your enemies. That's, that's not mm. bad. Yeah, Hitler was a very high quality enemy. That's true. <laughs> but I didn't think many declarations of war came down to personal. Right? Like, like it's like, <laughs> we don't want America anymore. You know, you're causing trouble, blah, blah, blah. But also these people. That guy. There's a, there's a few in particular Americans cousin, who I want to wipe out. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Utterly unworthy. So this, this was like Pearl Harbor. So then 1942, Wild Bill becomes the inaugural boss of the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS. Ah, the precursor to the CIA. Exactly. So he organized the OSS to reflect his idea of what an intelligence center should do. So he combines research and analysis, covert ops, counterintelligence, 
espionage, technical development stuff. That's which is all basically what the CIA does now. Technical development stuff. Stuff. You stopped yeah. reading at that point. No, that's what it said. Technical development stuff. This is a great reference. I, I, I like the idea that in CIA's terms of stuff. Uh, operation, yeah. etc., misc other other also black ops additional black, yeah random more of. And so what happened was he made the cornerstone of the OSS the research and analysis branch because he was really getting into this stuff. And they apparently provided a lot of assessment to the European allies in their bombing campaigns. And they studied operations where allied forces were fighting. They developed preparation plans and stuff to counter German attacks. Mm -hmm. And critically, according to this one quote, they validated Donovan's vision of a central all-source analysis capability by demonstrating the greater part of vital intelligence should be obtained not by jumping in behind enemy lines, but by pouring through papers, cables, reports, mm -hmm. photographs, etc., and yeah, like find really, out some information. Yeah, doing the meticulous. You know, work. it's still baffling to me that uh, we're talking 1940 mm -hmm. here. That uh, we've we've gone through many ages of governments, yeah. and you know, you go back to Machiavelli. You probably go back to ancient China, yeah. and there are spies. Yeah, and the fact that America survived until that long, You're like, hang on a minute, being spy free. It's. I mean, I'm, they must have had spies. Oh, but, yeah, but not but, organized by government. I, yeah, but that's so weird. It's very weird. It's, uh, I, I don't know. You can imagine I, coming back in 1940 and going, hey, President, we should have these spy Spying would things. be a good idea. Like, yeah. uh, uh, were they that that happy to take the world in good faith? Apparently, uh, there's that, a quote what? I didn't keep from a, a former version of some kind of military intelligence in the 20s who said, oh, gentlemen, don't spy on other people's mail or don't read other people's mail. Literal yeah, yeah, quote. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen that before. And yeah. it's like, uh, yeah, of course, gentlemen don't. But then you employ other people to do yeah. that for you. You get ladies to do it. Yes. Because they something. can't be gentlemen. Uh, but still, it's it's just so weird as a thing of statecraft. I, I agree with you. But, but it meant while Bill could, you know, find his place and seem even more remarkable. So the OSS, the OSS had um, like a bunch of operational groups that also ran enemies behind the lines, as you'd expect. They didn't just do thinky, dorky stuff. So they particularly- You can be dorks behind the lines. Like you can, you be, can do both, that's no, true. exactly. That's true. Like you go work in the archives being a dork behind the lines. I'm a undercover stealth dork. librarian. Uh, undercover dork. You, I guarantee there are- There, are, there would have been. There are librarians there are. that oh, are spies. Yeah. There are. So yeah, they trained a bunch of specific uh, military commandos. There are people who would fight in normal uniforms though, so that if they were busted, there was no connection to the OSS. So they wouldn't get shot as spies as well. So they fought. Okay. They were trained to be tough dudes, etc. But they acted as if they were normal soldiers. There was parachuting, amphibious operations, skiing, mountain climbing, radios, cool, espionage cool, tactics, cool. All, all the, the cool stuff. stuff. All the cool stuff. Um, and they they had groups fighting in France, Italy, Greece, Yugoslavia, Burma, Malaya, China, usually alongside other partisan forces. So they did the whole gamut. They ran mm. the whole lot. He set up espionage and sabotage schools. He had front companies, clandestine collaborations with international corporations and the Vatican, the biggest spy group of all. Uh, but still with the Vatican. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oversaw inventions of espionage-friendly guns, cameras and bombs. Like So he was doing it all. He recruited agents with, from a really wide range of backgrounds. So there are a lot of intellectuals and artists as well as people with criminal backgrounds. He hired heaps of women, which most people went, yeah, that's outrageous, women mm -hmm. aren't suited. Um, and also prominent and famous folk of the time, which is intriguing. Well, I like his um, ac uh, access and inclusion policy here. You know, we need Very, agents of uh, yeah. diversity. Good on him. Um, so he, like, film director John Ford, the, the, the Curie's daughter, Eve, like Murray and Pierre Curie's daughter was working with him. Really? Yeah. There was a poet called Archibald MacLeish, a banker called Paul Mellon, uh, a DuPont, a son of one of the DuPonts, Julia Child, the TV chef, she ended up being that. You know the woman? Yes, she, I do. She's a big, strong lady who was very yeah. popular in the TV chefing world. Uh, Carl Jung. Was a spy? He helped um, them analyse the psyches of Hitler and Nazi leaders. He was even buddies with Ian Fleming. Hmm. Hmm. But apparently the people used to joke there were so many aristocrats in the agency that the OSS stood for, oh, so social. Oh, okay. Like, ha, 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 okay. ha. So let's fast forward to Normandy, D-Day. Mm -hmm. Donovan and his commander of the covert operations in Europe, they're, they're in. Donovan's there. Yep. So his, his, uh, his commander is Colonel David Bruce, and a German fighter plane starts shooting at them. Mm. So they, they fall to the ground, and Bruce fell on top of Donovan and accidentally cut his throat with the edge of his helmet. What? I know. Which apparently the quote was, bled profusely, but nonetheless, 
Donovan sauntered inland to the American front lines. So I assume nothing but a flesh wound and kept oh on my going. God. You're not making your helmet right if you can get cut by it. Yeah, apparently a really sharp edge and it kind oh, of falls in, in the face of uh, aeroplane oh, wow. fire. And, and then they were confronted by heavy German like terrestrial machine gun fire and so they hit the deck. Donovan turns to Bruce and says, David, we mustn't be captured. We know too much. Oh, of course. So Bruce says, uh, yes, sir. Donovan then says, do you have the pill? Are we talking uh, we the pill with which you kill yourself? Yeah. Should you need? Yeah, which had been in, uh, created by a scientific advisor of the OSS. And Donovan says, never mind, I have two. Because he didn't have one. I, I brought one for you. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I get that uh, I don't want to be tortured for my secrets. And, uh, you know, you like to imagine that you could heroically chomp on the pill. But, well, but bringing one for your friend... So it's he goes, got, don't worry, I've got a, a, nice, uh, a nice power move. It's like I brought a suicide pill for you because <laughs> I've been looking yeah. and in, in your soul you need a suicide pill just in case. Yeah. Um, he said, yeah, don't worry, I've got two. So he starts rummaging through his pockets while still lying down under heavy machine fire. So oh. apparently he pulls out hotel keys, a passport, a whole bunch of different kinds of currency, photographs of his Lots grandchildren. Lots of condoms. Photographs of his grandchildren. Okay, fair enough. Travel orders, but no pills. <laughs> So he looks at Bruce and says, never mind, we can do without them. But if we get out of here, you must send a message to Gibbs, the hall porter at Claridge's in London, telling him on no account to allow the servants in the hotel to touch some of the very dangerous medicines <laughs> in my bathroom. <laughs> so he's like, ah, oh, fuck, I swapped it with aspirin. <laughs> then he says to Bruce, I, I'm going to shoot first. And Bruce says, yeah, but what good are our pistols against machine guns? Mm-hmm. He says, oh, no, no, you don't understand. I mean, if we're about to be captured, I'll shoot you first because, after all, I'm your commanding officer. So they've been in the field for 20 minutes. He's had, he's had a cut <laughs> and a saunter and a lie down. Yes, there's machine guns, but he's already like, a bit. We, we better discuss our suicide plan. Yeah, and our backup plan. <laughs> so anyway, look, this is a long story about Donovan. He was the shit, right? He was instrumental in a whole bunch of espionage training, the, the whole business in America a colossal number of acts of really extreme sabotage. That's fabulous. His career kept going and going. He's remembered for being the, the shit. But not everything he oversaw was huge in your face. So one thing a lot of people may have heard of or not realised they have was that he supervised and wrote the intro to the 1944 Strategic Services Field Manual Number no. 3, a.k.a. the Simple Sabotage Field Manual. Yes, yes, yes. So the simple sabotage field manual, it was not declassified until 2008. And it's 32 pages of pure gold. Now, you've probably seen some of the articles that popular magazines refer to. I, I've got a little a hint of it, yeah. I read the whole thing. <laughs> Donovan wrote the introduction, and there's a few things worth you know, setting the scene. The purpose of this paper is to characterise simple sabotage, to outline its possible effects, and to present suggestions for inciting and executing it. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. Sabotage varies from highly technical coup de main acts that require detailed planning and the use of specially trained operatives. Coup de main? Big. Could have just written that. Coup, coup de main. So big ones, big yeah. ones. To innumerable simple acts which the ordinary individual citizen saboteur can perform. Coup de citizen. Coup de... Coup de small. Tiny. Yeah, coup de tiny. Simple sabotage doesn't need special tools or training. Executed by ordinary citizen who may or may not act individually and without the necessity for active connection with an organised group. I've got to say, I've got to say, we live in a world where most people probably want to want to see society work. Yeah. It would be a little bit liberating to live in a world where you don't want society to work and just go, I just want to sabotage stuff all over the place. Keep in the back of your mind as I tell you these things. Oh, I'm writing them down in my brain right now. I reckon it's already happened. <laughs> right. And as, as we dig through these, you're going to go, mm-hmm. Yep. I think we are under attack. <laughs> okay, okay. Ordinary citizens, you don't, you don't want to have organised groups and stuff because it involves min- – this way you have minimal danger of being yeah. injured, detected, or being yeah. reprised against. Don't know what the other people are doing, then you exactly. can't dob them in. Yeah, you just kind of do your thing. So the we- weapons of the citizen saboteur are things like salt, nails, salt. candles, pebbles, thread, or any other materials they might normally find – just as a normal householder in their jobs. Right. So the arsenal, he goes on, it's always his because it was the time everything, everything in writing was mail. The arsenal is the kitchen shelf, the trash pile, his own usual kit of tools and supplies. And, of course, the targets of sabotage are everyday, normal, accessible, but inconspicuous or innocuous things in everyday life. Yeah. So there are heaps of subsections in this book, so I'll just pick through a couple because they're fun. 
there's first advice about how you, you know, how do you encourage people to do it? What safety measures should they take to mm-hmm. look after mm-hmm. themselves? So under encouraging destructiveness, th- this bit amuses me. It should be pointed out to the saboteur where the circumstances are suitable that he is acting in self-defense against the enemy or retaliating against the enemy for other acts of destruction. So tell them they're doing this to retaliate against naughty, yeah. naughty yeah, people. Yeah, sure. And he goes on to say, a reasonable amount of humor in the presentation of suggestions for simple sabotage will relax tensions or fear. So I tell him about it, we go, hey, badum ching, badum tish. <laughs> it's a funny way to encourage people. There are a bunch of safety suggestions. So it should be governed. What they do should be governed by whether they, not, not only the number of opportunities, but also how much danger they feel they may be yeah, in. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. And as he puts it, bad news travels fast. Simple sabotage will be discouraged if too many simple saboteurs are arrested. Oh, okay. Are we talking just enough to cause trouble for the enemy here? But not get busted. But not get busted. Yeah. yeah. And not to get busted so as to discourage other citizen saboteurs to yeah, okay. do the biz. Yeah, yeah. He goes on to say, look, again, for safety, try to commit acts for which a large number of people could be responsible. So the one man is Keith. Uh, Keith, yeah, Keith, yeah, Keith yeah. did it, obviously. But <laughs> once you've done an act of easy sabotage, resist the temptation to wait around and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Loiterers arouse suspicion. <laughs> <laughs> How were they giving this manual to people? I don't know. Okay. Right. I think well, it was let's, more- Let's just uh, work on the idea of them telling people. I think they told their operatives, or well, the operatives read it, but then they went out and mm. maybe, you know, had a beer and played a game Gave of darts. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Also, the saboteur should never attack targets beyond their capacity or the capacity of their tools. For example, an inexperienced person should not use explosives. Mm-mm-mm. Hard to argue. Yeah. But that's one type. There's a second type of simple sabotage that doesn't require tools. Universal opportunities, as they put it, to make faulty decisions, to adopt a non-cooperative attitude, and to induce others to do the same. <laughs> yes, yes. And a non-cooperative attitude may, the quote is, it may involve nothing more than creating an unpleasant situation <laughs> among one's fellow workers, <laughs> engaging in bickerings or displaying surliness and stupidity. <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to say, like, yeah, I, I, I'm not I, stupid. I'm a saboteur. I love how much that uh, we can see this in modern workplaces. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, are you sabotaging? But I also love the high mindedness of someone who is just a bickerer. Or, yeah. or just causing problems and going, yeah. no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting the man. I'm, I'm fighting. I'm, I'm conducting sabotage. I'm here. protecting you from the yeah, enemy. Maybe. And so the sorts of stuff we soft hand and milk toast type office workers can do. Yes, nice. There are a bunch of bunch sending of, emails slowly. Yeah, not wrong. Slowing shit down features a lot. Ah, oh, good. But the details are mm, they're delicious. So um, if you have any kind of control over switchboards, putting calls through, et cetera, you cut people off accidentally. Oh, accidentally pulled the cord. Or you forget to disconnect them so you leave the line open and it gets in the way. This is old school. Do you know, you know I was realising the other day, I don't know if you've had a bunch of spam calls recently. Not calls. No. Uh, I, I've been getting a bunch recently, or end of last year. And I said for a few times, take me off this list. Don't call me again. Don't call me. And you get to recognise the numbers until you don't call. Yeah. The other way around is you just answer but then let the phone sit there. Yeah. And so then you're wasting their time. Yeah. So way better. You're a, you're a citizen saboteur. Now man. I know. You're now a citizen I know. saboteur. Post office employees can make sure that the enemy's mail is always delayed by a day or more, put it in the wrong sacks. Oh, yeah, easy. Fuck with the addresses. And that counts today. And, I mean, whoever the enemy is here, let's, let's expand that to whoever you consider to be the enemy. For mass transport, they talk about trains, but this would work well for planes. And I think I would argue is working well for planes. Mm-hmm. Make it as inconvenient as possible. Make mistakes issuing tickets. Leave parts of the journey ticket portions uncovered by the issue of the ticket. Issue two tickets for the same seat so that an interesting argument will result. <laughs> Make sure the food is especially bad. Take up tickets after midnight. Wake people up really wait, wait, loudly wait, 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 wait. the night. Like, Make sure the food is especially bad. Like, like how is that going bring to bring down Nazi Germany if the food is bad on the trains? It'll make people feel terrible. And low morale... Equals end of the empire. I, no, look, I like the idea of booking two people on the same same seat because oh, that yeah. is that is an awesome little like interesting argument. People are going to have an annoying argument, and it's going to take yeah. an extra forty five minutes yeah. to resolve. Absolutely, yeah. but, and they're so, going to get to the other end when they're supposed to be, you know, keen witted and lethal mm-hmm. in the shits, and they've had a whole argument. We don't do well. We're in the shits, yeah, comparatively, and of course, you know, switch the baggage, mislabel the baggage, etc. There's a great one about uh, movies. So, of course, propaganda films at the time were important, but if you just want to fuck with people again, I mean, sorry, sabotage the enemy, 
Audiences can ruin enemy propaganda films by applauding really loudly to drown out the words. Extra clapping. Extra cough, clapping. cough loudly or keep talking. So it's just like, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. No, 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 wait. The Fatherland. My favourite. Anyone can break up the showing of an enemy propaganda film by putting two or three dozen large moths in a paper bag. <laughs> How hard could it be? I didn't like the idea. You did, did, uh, you've got a bag full of moths. Yeah. And, uh, and like the Gestapo are there and like, what? All right. my, these are my moths. Why are you carrying a bag full of moths? I'll show you. <laughs> and so, of course, they flutter into the beams of the, of the film and they, and they fuck it up. Or as oh. he puts it, the, be- the film will be obscured by fluttering oh, shadows. Oh, God. That, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> but you imagine that happening across theatres and towns that are under occupation or at least a surveillance. <laughs> It's like, oh, they've ruined it. And what are you going to do? Yes, there are a bunch of moths. That was my fault. So let's get to the office stuff. So there are some physical things, and there are, there are many, but this one I enjoy. Forget to provide uh, toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> That'd bother me. I mean, uh, it would, it would. After it, a week, it's... you're like, seriously. Oh, yeah. I can't use the recycled printing paper. Put tightly rolled paper hair, and other obstructions in the WC. Mm. And there's some detailed advice. Saturate a sponge with a thick starch or sugar solution. Squeeze it tightly into a ball. Wrap it with string and let it dry. Remove the string when it's dry. Then you flush it and it will or somehow get it in, like otherwise introduced into a sewer line. Oh. The sponge will gradually, gradually expand to its normal size and plug the system. Oh, oh. <laughs> I heard a terrible version of this years ago. This, this seems like an awful thing to do because the victims seem to be uh, everyday folks. Everyday folks. But uh, one version where you would um, turn off the water to a toilet, mm. flush the toilet so there's no water yeah. in there, oh. then uh, do your business and pull the lid down, and uh, <sighs> that it, it'll sit there and and. Uh, mature, mature, yeah, yeah, r- ripen, um, and and becomes unflushable at some point. And it's <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, maybe if you're fighting the Nazis this way, that yeah, might be fine. Do, do that in a Nazi toilet. I, f- I feel like that uh, is just too much. But uh, okay, the so Nazis are pretty bad. Bombing them's fine, but don't leave a drying <laughs> shit in their unflushable toilet. <laughs> well, that would have stopped Hitler. It really would have. That would have. Well, like, he was a neat or a clean freak, so it would have been like, "That is disgusting, Scheiser in my claw." Claw. That's what they call it. Das Claw. The water closet. <laughs> das Claw. So you can do shit like that. So get let's get into the, the stuff that really first attracted me to this stuff. Ad, administration and bureaucracy. Which you love. Oh, th- this to me, this was giving me ideas that I should not pay too much attention mm-hmm. to. There are many. So always as a manager or supervisor, demand written orders. Everything must be written down. You can't just take a word of a oh, mouthful. You can't tell people to do something no. verbally. you got to yep. yep. give me, give me a write. written down. So it takes an extra 10 minutes. Always misunderstand orders, ask endless <laughs> questions, or engage in endless correspondence about the orders and quibble over every detail. <laughs> I like the idea of always misunderstanding. Like, oh, you mean blah, I really don't. <laughs> Order high quality materials that are very hard to get and if you can't get them, argue about it and get the shits. Yeah, okay. I'm paraphrasing. And 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 argue that you're doing this for quality. Like if we want to do yeah, it right, well, we need to get the- Exactly that. So but, but how can I do my job properly if we don't yeah. get these diamond encrusted photocopy papers? Um, when you set up work assignments, always sign out the unimportant jobs first and make sure the important jobs are given to the worst workers with the crappiest equipment. <laughs> Insist on perfect work in relatively unimportant products and processes. Send it back to be refinished with, if there's the slightest of flaws. Don't train new work as well or train them the <laughs> wrong way. <laughs> if you really want to lower morale, give really inefficient and unpleasant workers undeserved promotions. <laughs> Oh, God damn, God damn, God damn. Like, I've never seen that anywhere. Not ever. E- Not never, ever, ever. See what I'm saying? This has been operating for years. We have, we have been, there's been a long war of sabotage against us and many countries it like is, us. It is against us. And when you realise that you are the vic- you're the bad guys in someone's mind mm-hmm. and all of those actions, oh, Jesus. Discriminate against good workers and complain unjustly about their work. Oh, Hold meetings when there is more critical work to be done. <laughs> insist on doing everything through channels and never permit shortcuts. <laughs> yeah. You know there are workers yeah. who they're like, shortcuts are bad. They're the enemy. They, Absolutely. Like, no, no, no. A goes to B goes to C. Thank you for being that awesome saboteur. You are beautiful. 
Uh, make speeches, talk as frequently as possible in a great length. <laughs> I like that. That sounds Illust- fun. Illustrate your points with long anecdotes and accounts of personal experiences. What? Make a podcast. Exactly. But we're not at work. Um, wherever you can, refer all mat- matters to committees for further study and consideration and make the committees as large as possible, never less than five. <laughs> Or obviously bring up uh, irrelevant issues as often as you can. Haggle over precise wording of communications, minutes, and resolutions. So, like, would anyone like to uh, endorse these minutes as, um, you know, true and accurate? And you're like, no, hang on a minute. I've just got to read them all right now during the meeting. Yes. I noticed that you have a missing comma. Yep. Advocate caution. Be reasonable. And urge your fellow uh, conferees to be reasonable. I love- Avoid haste. I love in all of these yeah. that, uh, you know, plausible deniability and reasonableness. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you, what, you know. No, I'm just trying oh. to be safe. I'm oh. just trying to be safe. I'm avoiding embarrassment for the organisation. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful <laughs> if it weren't so horrifying. <laughs> it's every shitty office comedy like it's everything. Be worried about the propriety of any decision. Raise the question of whether such action as is contemplated lies within the jurisdiction of the group or whether it might conflict with the policy of a higher echelon or another organisation. Nice. This is great. Apply every regulation to the last letter. Yes, of course. So that's for managers and so forth. For workers, it says things like make mistakes in the quantities of material when you order or copy orders. Confuse similar get a names. Zero. I've, I've, yeah. I've heard the get a zero wrong and yeah. then it's wild. Boom. Like, yeah. You order 10 times as much yeah. uh, toilet paper. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you well, then you can use that to block the sewers. We know <laughs> that now. Use wrong addresses, confuse similar names, misfile essential documents. This quote. Spread disturbing rumours that, quote, sound like inside dope. Inside dope? Inside dope. So like what? Why are we? I know, I know uh, people, that, you know, I've heard rumours from a, you know, a, a distinct and serious senior inside source. It's not like all organisations don't do it anyway. thrive on rumours all the time. But see, we've normalised the fact yeah. that we're being sabotaged. Yeah. So in general, work slowly. Contrive as many interruptions to your work as you can. So like when you go to the toilet, take a long time. Pretend instructions are hard to understand and ask to have them repeated repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> Snarl up administration every way possible. Fill out forms illegibly. Make mistakes or omit requests. <laughs> Fill out forms illegibly. <laughs> I'm loving. Um, I, I, uh, my handwriting yeah. is a weapon against you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, is yeah. so good. <laughs> it's like, oh, sorry, my PDF thing doesn't work, so I'm going to have to fill this out by hand and, and fax it to you. Um. Join, uh, it says join organisations that represent employees for their problems to management, but then bring up heaps of problems that are largely imaginary and garbage. <laughs> and closing summary pearls here. Give lengthy and incomprehensible explanations when you ask questions. <laughs> Be as irritable and quarrelsome as possible without getting yourself into trouble. <laughs> Two finals, maybe my favourites. One, act stupid. <laughs> And two, this will resonate with you because we've talked about this before as a way to get out of meetings. Cry and sob hysterically at every occasion, <laughs> especially when confronted by government clerks and other officials. <laughs> and Will and I, dear listeners, Will and I have talked about this when we're trapped in a meeting that we hate and we're texting at each other. It's like, okay, here's the thing. Stand up, start crying, then start laughing, then shit your pants, then hug everyone and run out of the room. <laughs> So in this, they've been underambitious. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can you imagine <laughs> employing this tactic? Cry and sob hysterically at every occasion. <laughs> We're going to need you to proofread this document. <laughs> oh, my God. I really, I really want to know. And this, this is the study that we'll never, we, we can't do. But who were the people that embraced this manual the most in occupied France or Nazi Germany that went, you know, <sighs> I'll read through these. Okay, I'm going to do the toilet paper and I'm doing the sobbing. Uh, yep. It's like, yep. oh, you're beautiful. Like, Do you know what's better? I would be delighted if this was my job. Come up with stuff like that. Oh, I'd be so happy. Oh, look, the coming up is awesome. I, uh, I, I've, uh, I, just, I just want to know the heroes, the heroes that implemented this stuff. The unsung librarians. <laughs> you know, there's like we've got Saving Private Ryan, we've got the yeah. Bridge Over the River yeah. Kwai, we've got uh, all of those. That movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> in a war. Predator. Uh, all of those amazing war movies. But, you know, somewhere is that gap in the war movie yeah. – Ugh. Yeah, you've got Spalding Poindexter <laughs> who's just been sitting in a little room going, <laughs> sobbing. This will fuck with them. Sobbing yeah. at his boss. Yeah. <laughs> so, honestly, by now, if you had any doubts about Wild Bill being a freaking genius, I mean, all the evidence is there now. Sure, he did all the other stuff, but this for me, he commissioned that. He wrote the intro. He's the guy. It's also easy to forget that someone had to be first. So, a lot of it might seem obvious now, but someone had to be first with all this yeah. shit. So, what happened to Bill? 
So there's a Vanity Fair piece, one of the main sources, but I'll tell you some more in a moment. 2011, and it says, um, His exploits are utterly improbable, but by now well documented in declassified wartime records, they portray a brave, noble, headlong, gleeful, sometimes outrageous pursuit of action and skullduggery. So he's the man. And I just love it. It's this guy who also commissioned the fuck with your, your workers in an office. Yep. Um, as World War II wound down, he became he got really into prosecuting war criminals. So he did a lot of stuff at Nuremberg. Then the trial's finished. He's like, what am I going to do? Goes back to Wall Street, gets a law firm, does well. He uh, remained always available to post-war presidents who requested his advice on intelligence matters. Eventually, 80, uh, 53, Eisenhower makes him ambassador to Thailand. Fuck knows why. Mm. He resigned in, that was in 53. He resigns in 54. He started showing signs of dementia while he was there in hospital in 1957. And apparently one of the worst episodes, he imagined he saw the Red Army coming over the 59th Street Bridge into Manhattan. Ooh. And he kind of said, I've got a mission. And he ran out of the hospital down the street in his pajamas to try and oh, stop sorry. them. So he got, it didn't go yeah. well at the end. And he died in 1959. So today he's known as the father of American intelligence, the father of the CIA. There's a bust of him in the lobby of the main building of the CIA. There's all kinds of awards. The William J. Donovan Award, the OSS created it, or the Society created it in 1947. And it was to it was a go to someone who has exemplified the distinguishing features that characterized General Donovan's lifetime of public service to the United States of America as a citizen and a soldier. Notable recipients, Eisenhower, mm-hmm. Margaret Thatcher, okay. George H. W. Bush. Uh-huh. So are they like him? Why couldn't yeah. they give the award out for someone who fucked up the works? The yeah, most? yeah, like, block the to, dunnies. Give it, give <laughs> it to the block greatest the dunnies. saboteur. You fucked the toilets in Berlin in 1943. I, You're the guy. So, I mean, like I've been alluding to this the whole way. I, here's a true legacy. We're surrounded by it. I'm convinced. Like wake up, sheeple. This is happening to us right now. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere we turn, we are being treated this way or we're doing it to ourselves. So um, I don't know what we're going to do. Some of the main sources anyway. So there's one called Spymaster General, The Adventures of Wild Bill Donovan and the Oso Social OSS. That's from Vanity Fair. That was a good one. The manual itself, which you can find relatively easily, simple sabotage field menu. And a couple of excellent biographies of Wild Bill um, from the CIA, from Britannica, and a, a military history fandom Wikipedia. There's a bunch of others as well that we'll obviously put in our show notes. There you go. Let's get sabotaging people. <laughs> Do it for good, though. Do it for good. Definitely. Like, uh, sabotage bad workplaces, sabotage your annoying idiot colleagues. Yeah. But uh, don't sabotage, sabotage the good people. You know the problem, right? They're already sabotaging us. God.